people are leaving the fields. There is a brain drain through discrimination. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Offspring Magazine, the podcast, the podcast where we talk about open science, careers in and out of academia, diversity in science, scientific research, and all kinds of PhD matters. Today, we are talking to the queer coach, Dr. Christian Magnus, about the unique challenges that can be faced by LGBTQ individuals in academia, and about how we as allies can make our workplaces more inclusive and what role institutional trainings can play to promote well being. I'm your host, Allison Lewis. In my interviews with Sophia Forsland and Nadine Gogolo, one thing they both highlighted was the importance of workplace training in helping everyone understand the power they have to create a welcoming environment for LGBTQ people. So today on the podcast, we are talking to Dr. Christian Magnus, or the Queer Coach, who offers training and workshops to help people understand subconscious biases and the institutional discrimination that can be experienced by queer individuals. giving us a quick introduction to yourself and what you do? What am I doing? We're, I have a lot of different jobs and um, passions. So I work as a school teacher right now because due to Corona, my business was also um, very like problematic for a time. I had to come back. Everything was canceled. So um, I started working at a school, which is super rewarding. So I'm working with children from very different age groups, and that gives me a great new perspective also on the topics of sex and gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, with which I work anyway. So that was a like, really enriching experience. Um, and apart from that, what I'm doing is I work as a trainer and coach and consultant for a variety of organizations. I've mostly worked with you know, social institutions, youth workers, research institutions like the MPIs um, or EMBL, um, which you might also know. What do I do there? Um, queer coach implies that I'm actually coaching individuals, but that's the least of what I do because I mostly work coaching the institutions to work to create a more inclusive environment. Mm -hmm. um, for LGBTIQs, I'd also mention the A's, so the allies here. So what I do is someone comes to me and they say, hey, we have this problem, for example. It's mostly uh, something like a concrete problem, like, oh, we want to talk about gender and language in our institution, pronouns or something yeah. like that. And they approach me and then in the conversation that follows, we usually find out that they actually need something else than just some info on one topic regarding sex and gender but that they maybe need like a bigger picture, something that helps them change also culturally as an institution. I hope this doesn't, this doesn't sound wrong or come across arrogant, but a lot of institutions think they're pretty far ahead, especially research institutions, because they are in their fields. And then what happens is they feel like, oh, we're like so excellent in this one field. We must also be excellent when it comes to um, the social sphere, the climate that we have. And sometimes they find out, oh, there's actually a long way to go to still improve things. With the social organizations, it's a bit more. Um, I work, for example, with um, an institution that wanted to open housing projects for trans youth, and I help them understand what their own profession means in respect to working with trans people. And um, I'm not trans. Well, I, I'm a non-binary uh, person that is not very, like, I don't use um, usually uh, different pronouns because it's, um, it's hard in German, as you might know, yeah. harder than it is in English. But uh, I can relate. I'm, a, I'm literally like a fat non-binary queer living yeah. in Berlin. So I have some experience with that. So it doesn't just come from an intellectualized view of gender and sexual orientation and gender identity. But I think it's also some lived experience that goes into it. Yeah, and it combines with me coming from an educational and research background. So I think that helps to open doors or understand researchers better. Very cool. So I have, I have two questions. One is, is then about pronouns. So in English, would you like me to use they, their pronouns with you? 
No, it's absolutely fine if you use he, okay. um, but I always put them down in writing so that it's very clear to people that I don't associate with the binary <laughs> view of the world um, okay. in a way that most people do. But to be fair, it also is a door opener for many people from both sides, from the side that actually wants to work with pronouns and use different pronouns and for the site that feels very uncomfortable, not because they don't like other people having different pronouns, but because they're afraid of doing things wrong or, or not knowing how to approach. Okay. The other question I wanted to know is like, it seems like you have a very unique career for a lot of academics. Like you, you did a master's degree as well. Like what's your, what was your educational background to get into a career like this? So, um, I come from a very low income background, so academia was very far away. Mm -hmm. And I still feel that as an effect today. So academia wasn't something I, I dived into and I was like, yeah, I'm doing a master's, I'm doing a PhD, but I somehow um, ended up there anyway. And I studied education. I also studied state law and um, theology, which is odd to, to a lot of people because they don't see how all of that can go together. <laughs> but to me, it made total sense. And yeah, so after the master's, I wanted to do a PhD, but it was very hard for me to get into the right programs. Also, sometimes due to like social factors, I'm not very good in the clandestine way of making my way in a research institution. I'm very open. I'm very outspoken. I also think, I didn't used to think that, but I also know that I have competencies that I would not have um, if I came from a, like an upper middle class background. Like uh, solving conflicts or using conflicts to spark learning and, and stuff like that. So um, it was hard for me, but I somehow made it into a project where I actually worked as a project manager for a bigger group. We did like an organizational project in an educational research institution. And at the same time, I did my PhD on project management in higher education institutions. Okay. Um, which is pretty interesting, also sometimes helps to understand some factors because educational management is something that research institutions can also need sometimes. Then I started to, like, I realized, oh, I want to do more about queer and LGBTIQ, and I hit walls. So my, the, the professors who were my supervisors recommended not to dive into those topics because they would hurt my career. Um, I, I did my PhD in Heidelberg, very conservative, very traditional university, mm -hmm. and uh, I ran into a lot of obstacles. And if you, if you really want me to do something, the best thing you can is to tell me I can't, <laughs> or that I shouldn't, because it really sparks some, some dumb resistance in me. And so I went for those topics, um, besides doing the PhD, and wherever I ended up working with people people came and were interested because these topics are not very prominent in Germany in research at all. Yeah. They're like you have some niche, uh, <laughs> a life in a niche, but they're mostly uh, women's studies, but we don't really have queer studies, gay studies here, which is an absolute shame, mm -hmm. which also explains why I'm working a lot in English or why I publish stuff in English, because it is very hard to somehow, you know, push it under the rug here somewhere and be like, oh, this is education or um, this is educational research because people will be like, what is this? Like, uh, it's like a Trojan LGBT horse that you're trying <laughs> to sell us. So I heard things like, oh, don't do our research on that. We, you don't want to be too politicized and stuff like that. I also heard you don't want to do this as um, a gay person, which I identified it um, as at the time, because then everyone will be like, oh, you're just doing this because you're gay. Mm. And then I was like, oh, are you saying that same thing to, to BIPOC people who do African-American studies or something like that? Like, yeah, or women is, who are in women's studies. Yeah, exactly, or women who are in women's <laughs> studies. So, um, yeah, so some resistance there. And then I started working with people, and, well, of course, it was so much easier um, with these topics in America, in Sweden, uh, where people are more interested and the whole discussion is a little bit further ahead sometimes okay so so the people like your advisors who discouraged you basically kind of thought like it's too political or it's going to look like you have this ulterior motive those were the kind of the underlying barriers that they thought they had that they thought you might have yeah i don't like i think they were protective of my career 
okay. or try to help me. And I mean, we have to, or I had to acknowledge that academia is very much, there were a lot of hierarchies in there, right? Mm -hmm. And you better work with something that your supervisor works with. And if there's no one who does what you do, you can't really connect to that. Like there is a lot of examples throughout all disciplines where people cannot connect with new ideas, which is, by the way, crazy, right? I mean, in research and science, isn't that what we were actually supposed to do? Yeah. But I feel there is some some kind of orthodoxy. And if you don't abide the rules of the, this orthodoxy, you have a problem. And I did not do that. So at some point I left. I did a postdoc position for a few years and I realized I also even made it into the, the sphere where you actually get on these lists where you can become like a junior professor or something like that. Oh, cool. But in hindsight, I feel it was the right time then to leave because it also hurt me on a, on a well, like my well-being was not, not great. I didn't feel super because work was a constant struggle, not just with um, sex and gender, but also with my social background. You needed to leave academics because you felt it wasn't good for your well-being. And so I'm wondering like kind of what that says about the field of academia or what's, you know, what it was impacting your well-being in academia. I can only speak for mostly for the German, like academic fields. Yeah. But if you look at academia in the post-war time, so after 1945, you see that most of the very successful German researchers were all upper class people, mm -hmm. and they mostly left science a while, but had the money to still finance what they were doing and then come back into it to win uh, a Nobel Prize or something like that. Yeah. And that says something about the, the ability of individuals to not abide the rules, because I think you have to have this ability. And if you don't have it, you can only go so far. I guess I, uh, I would just follow up on like, what do you mean by, by this ability? Like kind of this, uh, this ability, like financially, is it a... It is a financial thing, but it is also a support thing. Okay. Um, as humans, we always, and that is something very important for inclusion and diversity, we pick people that we think that they relate to us in some way, and we know how to handle them, or we know who they are. Mm -hmm. That's just what we do. It's nothing evil in itself, but it leads to a lot of unconscious bias. Yeah. And academia has a certain set of skills that you await from someone who enters it, a certain behavior, and if people are not like that, it is hard to integrate them and it's probably also hard for a supervisor to really support them or uh, put them to the next level or, you know, put their name in front in a publication or stuff like that. And also the internal struggle in academia is always that you have to cooperate all the time, but you also compete at the yeah. same time. And after I had left academia and I worked as a self-employed person, not having any money, not having any friends, and I, I started working in a Berlin um, a startup co-working place, I realized for the first time how easy corporations can be if no one is um, competing. I mean, of course, people are competing in, in a free market as well, but they're also interested in what you're doing and they're not afraid that someone's going to take away their job or that you make professor before they do. I mean, let's face it, people who do a PhD, 80% of them will not end up being a professor yeah. or way more than 80% actually, but a lot of them won't even stay in academia. Yeah. Um, and you know that when you're in a room with 10 other researchers and that does something to the, to the climate and the atmosphere in there. And that's no different in higher, like in, in research institutions that are very excellent, like MPI institutes, because they're so high up. There's um, not so, so much further to go, right? <laughs> Yeah. Where, where do you think the, the, the level of the issue is? Like, do you think in science and in academics, there's a misunderstanding of exactly like what it even means to be maybe gender nonconforming or to have a different like sexual orientation or gender identity? Or do you think it's more, okay, I understand what that is, but I don't understand your experience. At what level are we even operating in academia? Well, mostly people don't know what LGBTIQA means. Okay. That is really where we start. <laughs> a lot of people don't know. Uh, when I have mixed groups, in, like interculturally mixed groups in um, trainings, I see that mostly the people that come from the U.S. have a, like a broader understanding, the U.K., um, I'd say the Anglo-Saxon Saxon world. Mm -hmm. 
course, also some very liberal states like like Sweden and, and Denmark and Finland that a lot of the people don't know. And in Germany, a lot of people don't know what LGBTIQA means. Okay. Um, so you start from scratch. You really start from not just, it's not just that they don't relate to an experience you have, but they're also afraid of engaging with the topic because yeah. they know that they don't know something about this topic. Um, so they might have to learn or think about something that they might even be uncomfortable thinking about. Because once you start reflecting on sex and gender like that kind of work always starts with yourself yeah and you know, some people might not dive into it right away like that but you have to reflect on who you are and that is a moment of insecurity so is this where you think like training at institutions can come in to fill those gaps oh absolutely like the worst thing you can do is to go into an institution any organization and give them like a behavioral lecture this okay. is the pronouns you're supposed to use. This is what you're supposed to do in emails. This is what you're supposed to do uh, in the hallway. And this is what you're supposed to do for the summer party or the staff meeting or whatever. This is the wrong way because it does two things. First of all, it gives false security because these issues are changing. And LGBTIQ is not a monolithic block, yeah. neither in STEM fields, nor in science, nor in, in societies at large. It is different groups. And the only experience they share is discrimination based on sex and gender yeah. um, and, and gender identity and sexual orientation and all of that. But that is like a very small common denominator to make it a group. Yeah. Um, and different groups have different problems, different needs, experience, different kinds of discrimination um, or unconscious biases. And yeah, absolutely. So to answer your question, yes, you always have to start from like, you have to make, um, the like the well, like healthy upper class white <laughs> cis male in the corner relate to this topic and understand oh this is something that restricts me too yeah. i cannot express myself even if i wanted to in a certain way i cannot come here in a skirt i cannot wear makeup and at first of course it's going to be like oh but i don't want to wear makeup that's not part of my routine i don't want to wear a skirt sure you don't want that but think about it you can't like, this is something that restricts you and, like, you're not free to choose because people will react to that. And gender nonconformity is the biggest issues people have in institutions. Yeah. You can be gay, you can be trans, you can whatever. As long as you pass and don't make us feel uncomfortable about our day-to-day -day, uh, biases, um, everything's fine. But as soon as you start coming, like, out of this box, for example, I wear eye makeup, mm -hmm. I wear nails. I do that every day in school, but I also have um, a beard which is the sign that you're male, right? Yeah. And um, um, uh, I told you this before, but I'm also um, working as a drag queen and I would highly encourage people to also like look into that and, and follow me. My drag name is Shady Darling. So oh, that's um, a good drag name. Yeah, I, like I think that. it's very generic, but um, so is Shady in some ways. So, <laughs> um, and I, I have a lot of fun with it. Um, so if you're interested, like um, Shady Darling is a Shady underscore Darling on, on Instagram. And, and what I see is like, I'm doing drag with a beard. Yeah. And that is just annoying to people because it fucks with your perception of gender. It's not so easy. Like if I'm a beautiful drag queen in a, in a size zero and, and there are these people, that's great. People like they play with the scandal that this is actually a man in that dress. <laughs> but once you don't abide by that and you're like, no, I'm just, I like to wear makeup and I always did. And I never felt that that was wrong, but I always felt that I had a huge backlash once I'm doing that. Then they were annoyed. Because yeah. you're unapologetic about who you are. And that is something that sparks insecurity in people, especially when it comes to sex and gender, something they sometimes don't reflect on. Same, by the way, is a lot of people in STEM institutions, like it's a, it's a very male-dominated field, right? Yeah. Um, all of those subjects are very male-dominated and um, a strong image of what a man has to be like or who a man, a real man is, always sparks things like homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, and um, makes it even harder to open up. So I think the STEM fields are special in that way. And when you look at the reports and uh, the research, what LGBTQIA's experience in discrimination in STEM fields, you see what I just told you, like gender nonconformity is a big problem. They get harassed, some get blackmailed. The STEM field is also not something that only exists in the US, in Germany or England, to name some places where there is some protection, but it also exists in other places. 
it's not just about the harassment you actively experience through colleagues or through institutionalized rules or something like that. Mm -hmm. For trans people, for example, names, when they don't want to change your names or pronouns and documents, etc. So it's not only about who harasses you or bullies you, it's also about where you can go and where you feel safe. So it sounds like there's barriers at like a lot of levels. So yeah. you talked about you talked about barriers even at an individual institution among the colleagues you work with and then even higher level barriers more systemically across science for yes. where you can work. And I guess I want to know kind of thinking about those two different levels like how can you overcome those barriers to actually increase acceptance and get the message that you want to get across in the workplace and then moving up systemically? Well, being a social scientist, I always have to acknowledge that there is not just the subject, but also the world. So mm -hmm. the question is, can you really tear down all those barriers? And I said earlier that you really have to take into consideration allies. Yeah. I think it is very important to recognize if you're an activist, especially if you're an activist that is queer themselves, and I use queer as an umbrella term here, okay. that you have to find allies that are not directly affected by the topic you're talking about and that you fight for because it gives them an emotional resource you don't have. If yeah. someone attacks like uh, LGBTIQs at large, and that happens even in workshops, okay. it kind of also affects me. But if I'm fighting, for example, for HIV positive people, which I, I would like, I like to engage in those topics because I want to be an ally there, or, yeah. or I fight for women's rights, I'm not affected by that. I can very calmly but like you know strongly fight for what i think is right instead of feeling the pressure of activism or work all the time yeah because being an lgbtiq person normally means that you're either closeted which means you're not out so people don't know who you are that is true for a high percentage in the for example in the german labor market a lot of people don't know that their colleague is gay queer whatever yeah. but if you are out and a lot of people are you're exposed all the time Okay. So um, it's not just about how to fight barriers, but also live with the fact that you're continuously looked at, ask questions. And I think a lot of marginalized groups experience that. It's not just LGBTIQs. And if you belong to more than one marginalized group, it even adds up. So it's even more stressful. So everything I said yeah. earlier about me coming from like a, a low income background also added up to me being queer gay, non-conforming, whatever. Of course, you can tear down some barriers and you can fight for your rights, but you also need other people who help you. You need allies in the institution. And you need, for example, equality officers that don't just think, oh, I have to fight for women's rights or the rights of disabled people, but I have to somehow find a way uh, to include different groups. And that's also important. Sometimes what they want is not coherent or even works like against each other. For example, in my um, direct work environment in meetings, it says how many males and females vote for stuff uh, in, a, in a specific meeting. And I don't like that because I feel excluded. But the equality officers come to me and say, hey, we fought for this a long time because we think women need a voice and we want to have it visible, how many women are involved in this process. Yeah. Um, so you need to find individual solutions for individual institutions and need to find help to tear down barriers. And you also need systemic change, which means you have to have rules and guidelines that help people to know what they're actually supposed to do or not supposed to do. But sometimes the things like the, the problems are so small. And a good example is voyeuristic transgressions. Um, queer people, gay people, in, like for example, are often asked, hey, who's the man and who's the woman in the relationship? Which is, of course, in itself a weird question. Yeah. And um, I have this picture um, that I use in, in my um, lectures that um, show two chopsticks on one side, and there is a fork and a knife on the other. And the knife asks the chopsticks, so who's the fork and who's the knife? <laughs> it, it is that kind of level we're on, right? And it doesn't seem like an offensive question, but all it does is it tries to put a heteronormative idea that there's a man and a woman, there's, I don't know, good and evil. It's very entrenched, by the way, in, in Western reasoning that we always have this duality of things. They put this on you and then you're like, what is actually going on? Like, I don't know. I don't care Yeah. Um, who is the man and who is the woman and all of that. Yeah. 
as I've said earlier, we also see this with other marginalized groups. Um, there's this whole movement um, where BIPOC and especially black people say, we don't want our hair touched, yes. right? And I, I think it is, a, I, I don't want to compare it because uh, racism and sexism aren't the same in every aspect, no. but it's, it's an analogy of being transgressive out of curiosity. Yeah. And that, that is a good rule, by the way, for everyone who has a question for a trans person, a, a gay person, bi, or intersex, whatever. If you ask the question out of pure curiosity, it might be smarter not to ask it. <laughs> so when would you say, I guess maybe it's hard to classify, like, is it is it ever okay to ask questions? Absolutely. Of course, you have to be able to read a room and you have to be <laughs> able to know who you're asking. And if that person's your friend, you can fully engage. But a lot of people from marginalized groups don't want to be your personal educator um, on an everyday basis because, of course, you get ask these questions a lot and over and over yeah. trans people get asked all the time um, about transitioning and shit and they don't want to like answer all of these questions because why yeah anyway ask questions definitely but ask them politely and also try to get some information from the internet beforehand maybe or just, like google it try to educate yourself offline without taking time out of other people's time budget <laughs> this might sound a bit dumb but you really get asked these questions a lot and yeah i I ask just because I've, I've also heard other perspectives talking to to trans people who they say they feel a bit self-conscious when people specifically ask them about their pronouns because then yeah. they wonder, do you ask everyone about their pronouns? Yes. Or are you just asking me because I'm trans? Yes. And so now I'm thinking, like, how do we normalize these interactions yes. so that people now don't somehow feel othered yes. because you're asking about their pronouns? Yes. And so... I don't know. I, I, I worry that I'll, that maybe like one barrier as an ally is like something I personally feel anxious about. Like I've included my pronouns in my email sign off now, as this was a suggestion made by uh, a trans person for how to communicate you're an ally. But mm. like doing it in my day to day life, I almost wonder, like, if I say, hi, I'm Ali, I use she, her pronouns, are, are people going to be like, why are you telling me this? Like, the, are you trying to be political? Like, I wonder if you have any tips for like our day-to-day -day things and how we can interact with other people who might meet us with like confusion and hostility. Like, why are you telling me about your pronouns? Well, first of all, if someone meets you with confusion and hostility that you actually mention your pronouns, that is problematic in itself. I, I would, <laughs> uh, would call that out. I would really do that. Okay. And say, hey, why are you coming at me for, for trying to be inclusive and create an inclusive environment here? Which is an important thing. You have to call out discriminatory behavior. Yeah. Another point where it's hard in research institutions to do that. I'm doing, uh, I have like little cases that I bring to my trainings. And then people are supposed to like after a full day of gender and, and gender identity and everything and the norms and how we deconstruct them and then the young researchers it's mostly young people mm -hmm. um some group leaders sometimes they go through these cases and work through them and there is one case where for example someone like a group leader or whatever touches someone on the shoulder and they feel yeah. uncomfortable about it and uh, about it and then there's like a, a series of questions that i have for every case which is how do your colleagues react how do you react? What do you do? Where you can get help? Da, 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 da. Yeah. And it turns out one day of my training is not enough to enable people <laughs> to forget where they are because they will still be like, oh, yes, but the person might not think that this is a problem. And I might don't I, I don't want to say that because if that's my supervisor, that might you know put a strain on a relationship and I still yeah. need this person. That's what I meant earlier about why it's difficult especially in like elite institutions because you're so dependent on these people to support you to in best case scenario root for you to be better and 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 you know unfold to your full potential and um so people are super afraid that if they mention this or make this a problem um that that will hurt their career and hurt their research and um that is sad that's a specific problem in science you don't have that so much in other fields, I feel you probably have it the higher up you go everywhere. Mm -hmm. But there's also some places where the hierarchies are more flat. Yeah. Um, social institutions, for example, education, 
it's easier because you're more like a standalone project. You're not so super dependent. I mean, I can appreciate how even in a flat hierarchy, though, like these can still be issues because even as something like as simple as calling out discrimination, like you do need to, I assume, do it in such a way that you don't attack the other person because you commented on how so much in research is collaborative and cooperations Mm. and having good working relationships with people. So how do you balance like being proactive and calling out discrimination while still maintaining a collegial environment? And so I, I can, I can appreciate how that might be something people struggle with who aren't used to doing this. Everyone struggles with that because it, literally means how willing are you to show your true colors and how much are you willing to compromise to get something that you might want Mm -hmm. and that is something that is a in my opinion a social effect that you have in the higher social stratosphere that you compromise way more because things are more clandestine Mm -hmm. you don't call out stuff like i've lived through so many experiences where two bosses on a like two professors had a problem with each other and what they did is they hurt their employees. You know, it's just like this old game. It's a little bit like chess. Yeah. And um, to me, that was something I could not live with. Because I, and that is, actually, me leaving that research is uh, field education is the same as a lot of people leaving STEM fields for being LGBTIQA. And it happens. Like, we didn't talk about the specific um, discrimination or discriminatory forms enough, but um, we can talk about the effects. People are leaving the fields. There is a brain drain through discrimination. And of course, people's well being is affected. If you look, there's reports on um, STEM fields, how LGBTIQAs feel. Yeah. And usually they have a problem with their well being. Usually they feel less healthy, they feel more stressed. Uh, and all of that goes, of course, into that little backpack that we all carry. And the heavier it gets, the harder for you it gets to climb this hill that we call life, I guess. Okay. So I guess do you, since you mentioned it, do you want to just cover like what does discrimination look like in, in STEM? Why are people leaving STEM? The problem with this is there is so much and different groups, as I've said before, experience different kind of discriminatory behavior. There is some discriminatory behavior that is shared, the experience of that. But for example, trans people feel more alone overall, if you look at the studies at least. Mm-hmm. And it is always like hard to be someone in a group and you stand out in a way because that can can get stressful but overall also lgbtiqas are also seen less competent in stem a lot of the time by the way this is a a problem also connected to women being seen as less competent in uh, stem fields and math we know that's not true Uh, we know that from studies but that's something they experience they also have less role models if you look at the room i always um uh, I like to talk about Donna Strickland. Um, uh, I think she's a, a Nobel Prize winner. I always keep the jumbled up prices, but I think a Nobel Prize she won mm-hmm. for um, doing great research in, in laser technology. And half a year before she had won the Nobel Prize, someone tried to make a Wikipedia entry for her. And it didn't take because the administrator said she's not a relevant per- a person relevant enough to be on Wikipedia. Oh my gosh. And um, of course, to win a Nobel Prize, she already had to have some experience and some articles out there and shit. So my professors from that little university of education where I worked a while, they all had a Wikipedia entry. The men, I have to say here. (laughs) And um, no one thought they're not relevant, but someone thought, oh, Donna Strickland's not relevant enough. So they clicked a no button. Now, I think... 98% of administrators there are male, and most of the articles in there are about males. So we don't have representation um, for successful LGBTIQAs and women enough. Also for the other groups, we don't have enough successful people of color, indigenous people, etc. And we need that to make other people down there know, okay, I can get up there as well. Um, I can also make my way. So it's also a lack. I am... also um, want to say that this isolation is something that makes people leave. So if they feel isolated, circling back once more um, also to, to trans and non, gender non-conforming people, if you feel isolated, you consider leaving. And that is also stressful because you don't know where you end up, mm-hmm. what your life is going to look like, if you can actually make it. And it leads to something that we call internalized trans and homophobia, 
we see that in a lot of marginalized groups, and I know I've said that a lot, but um, it's also important because this intersectional perspective should not get lost. And so I guess as like an ending note, I'd really, I'd like to try to convey what are everyday things we can do as allies? You talked about how the importance of allies to advocate because we are a bit at arm's length. What can we do in our daily interactions to advocate for those individuals, but also create an environment where they feel safe if they want to come out, to feel like they can be seen as who they are? Well, first of all, I think it is good not to assume other people's sexual identity features, which is super hard to do because we're so trained to do that, that to unlearn that is a huge step. But ask yourself, for example, if you see a, non, a gender non-confirming person and you ask yourself, are they male, are they female? Then make a, a, a note uh, in your head and come back to that question. Is that important to you and why? <laughs> are you, is there a romantic interest that you have that, is, uh, that would make that question important? Or do you need to, like, is there really, and usually you'll end up, with a no, it is yeah. not important to you. So try not to assume that or ask yourself, but try to live for five minutes with the reality that it actually doesn't matter. And once you can let go, that's, that makes it way easier. Yeah. Ask for pronouns, especially in groups, especially uh, if it's like a new setting. If you hire new people or if you hire people in general or in your emails, you can include pronouns. It's not a problem. Be aware of what discriminatory behavior looks like or is. I guess. You should also strongly call out discriminatory behavior. So that means you should know what kind of behavior that is. I mean, those are all things that are more complex and that people have to learn, but it's good to keep that in mind. And I would include other perspectives and try to challenge unconscious biases, which is also very hard to do. Mm -hmm. Be okay with other people's boundaries if they don't want to engage, talk about something that's also completely fine. And in the, the MPIs, for example, you have like rules of conduct or codes of conduct and guidelines and stuff might not um, be a bad thing to read them at some point or, or, or browse through them. And I have to be this, uh, I have to put this little piece of marketing in there, not because it's a piece of marketing, but because I think it is real. Have someone come to your institution and teach you about these things. Like most people are not able to differentiate between what is gender identity what is gender expression? What is biological sex? What is sexual orientation? Yeah. And if you are not aware of what these things are, you cannot challenge conflicts or, or discrimination. Yeah, or at least it's very hard because you always fight against some con like confusing cloud of um, feeling uncomfortable. But you can actually rationalize these things. And I don't think that gender and gender identity have to be intellectualized wholly, but also felt. But at the same time, you need some intellectual food to be able to challenge that. So education <laughs> is, I think education is a very powerful tool in um, being an ally and being a queer person, likewise. After doing these interviews, I feel I am starting to understand better the unique challenges faced by LGBTQ academics. Whether that's being accepted for who you say you are or not seeing yourself represented and wondering how you might fit in. I hope moving forward, it becomes commonplace for institutions like the MPG to take a leading role in addressing these challenges by offering trainings and I think even expanding the role of the equality officer to support more underrepresentative groups in science. I know I work my best when I feel secure and happy and I hope together we can create a workplace where we all feel this way a little more often. That's our show. Thanks for joining us and to our guest, Dr. Christian Magnus. Until next time, bye-bye. Offspring Magazine, the podcast, is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD Net and the Science Communication Working Group, known as the Offspring Magazine. This episode was produced by Allison Lewis and Sandra Fendel. It was edited by Adrian Lahola Chomiak. The intro outro music is composed by Srinath Ramkumar, and the pre intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Carrizo. The podcast series is hosted by Adrian Lahola Chomiak, Allison Lewis, Beatrice Landsbergen, Nikolai Herman, and Srinath Ramkumar, 
with social media support from Nadia Piragova. For any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to write us at offspring.podcast at phdnet.mpg.de.